Good morning, one and all. Everyone attending online and those of you who are following on YouTube, welcome to our event on World Chagas Disease Day 2022. Because of our time limitation and we have a full agenda today, there won't be room for debate with the audience. But at any rate, you can use the chat box in Zoom to send in your comments, which will be submitted to all the participants and shared with them. So we thank you for your kind understanding. Established by the 72nd World Health Assembly and celebrated for the first time on April 14, 2020, World Chagas Disease Day was established aiming at awareness raising concerning this neglected disease. This year, the theme of World Chagas Disease Day is to improve notification and epidemiological surveillance of acute and chronic cases, as well as the tra active transmission routes, which are essential for persons affected by the disease and interrupting transmission. And with the, the generations that have been affected, this will help us to know where we are and how many people have uh, the infection with Chagas disease. Today's event was organized by the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation is celebrating the thematic series with 15 articles by specialists worldwide with the objective of reflecting on the challenges of a research agenda for confronting Chagas disease in the future. You are now invited to attend the entire day's activities. We will now hear two videos which are part of the 2022 campaign for World Chagas Disease Day under the WHO. So please. Today, we'd like to talk to you about the Chagas disease. It's an invisible disease, but with which we live every day because it's in many places on the planet and affects many people. Chagas disease can be found in both children and adults in pregnant women and in their infants and in grandmothers and grandfathers. Chagas disease is in couples and families and in single people as well. But in reality, nobody is alone in this disease. We're all together to help each other to control this disease and to live better. That's why uh, you need to help us to find out where the Chagas disease exists and how many people have it. Report your case. It's an act of love and responsibility. More than 120 people in more than 15 countries participated in creating this uh, logotype, including people affected by Chagas disease. This spot was a contribution by the Mundo Sano Foundation and Elea. Hello, my name is Marcelino Huertas. I'm the captain of Brazil's basketball all-star team. I've worn this jersey hundreds of times in uh, local and global events. I've worn this jersey in my own country, if, and it's a disease that affects many boys and girls. I want to announce that uh, I'm wearing another jersey today. We, this is an invisible disease that affects many people, 7 million people across the world, especially in Latin America. I am wearing the jersey for World Chagas Disease today. And I am Marcelino Huertas. I am wearing the jersey of World Chagas Disease. I, this, I'm part of the World Chagas Disease Day. Marcelino Huertas wearing the t-shirt of Chagas World uh, Chagas Disease Day. The Chagas Disease affects more between six and seven million people in the world. Chagas disease has a heavy socioeconomic and environmental determinants. Its detection and treatment in children and women affected uh, will is part of the epidemiology of this disease with the support of the World Health Organization. Microfone, é isso. 
That the videos were wonderful, right? We begin our opening panel, and to begin, we have the Minister of Health, Marcelo Queiroga, who sent us a video, which we will now attend, watch. Carlos Chagas is a reference for Brazilian science and for health sciences is a reference, a global reference. We can say that he would be the first translational scientist in Brazil using the experience from the lab bench and translating them to patient care and his Research spirit meant for the first time a single researcher identified the etiological agent, the factor, the epidemiological aspects, the clinical condition and treatment of the disease. That is why he should be a reference for all of us, for each of us who are dedicated to research in Brazil. His efforts as a leader of public health in Brazil and the president of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation resulted in the efficiency in confronting the uh, Spanish flu pandemic in the early 20th century. And as a leader at the National Department, Health Department, he created the foundations for what we have today in public health in Brazil, which is the Unified Health System, SUS, on April 14. Uh, April 14 celebrates the World Awareness Raising Day for uh, Chagas disease. It's a commitment for each of us each of the healthcare professionals and also the Minister of Health uh, to keep alive the struggle launched by Carlos Chagas for this neglected disease to no longer be a public health problem in Brazil and in the world. Now I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Pedro Bajar Vindas, responsible for the Chagas Disease Control from the Department of Tropical and Neglected Diseases in the World Health Organization. Good morning. Allow me uh, to salute President Nizia Lima of Fio Cruz and through her to greet all the members of this international panel. First of all, I would like to thank Fio Cruz and that for organizing this event. It's a huge privilege to have had the collaboration of different units of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation facilitating these reflections at the global level as a view towards the challenges and opportunities for the future, in the future. In fact, the Chagas disease, uh, 120 years, was born in 2019 at the exact time when we were establishing the roadmap for 2021 to 2030 of the World Health Organization concerning neglected tropical diseases. The previous roadmap in 2012 was finishing in 2020 in several meetings as that held in Shanghai and or in Paris and Rome discussed in the present and proposed uh, directions for the future. At that time, the joint organization, uh, the 55th uh, uh, meeting of the, in the 26th Brazilian Congress of Parasitology in Belo Horizonte, and subsequently uh, the 26th annual meeting of the few Chagas program in Petropolis were prime places for progress in reflections and definition of uh, the five objectives which find and goals which provided the roadmap was approved in the November of the following year in 2020 in the 73rd World Health Assembly. And we, the pandemic struck, a syndemic rather, which suddenly changed the scenarios and exponentially increased the challenges with a limitation in the available resources and in time and instrumental uh, human resources, including with the painful loss of our dear co editor Juliana Mendes, uh, our love, Jorge Escorre, a professor, the professor, and now uh, uh, Joseph, as the poet Drummond says, it's up to us 
it behooves us to be able to translate the materials and reflections in different languages and languages and to be shared with all people affected and all the stakeholders who have their hands on attempting to determine and learn how and how many people have are directly or indirectly affected by Chagas disease in the world. An essential element for progress in the roadmap that was established at that time. A few days ago, I was joking with Angela and Savino explaining that the project in this series reminded me of people who didn't know that that was impossible, but did it anyway with the generous help and priceless help of so many people, some of whom are certain will be participating today online. And I quote Angela in August 2019 in Petropolis, when Angela said what I could say with people who are marching together, I would do everything again uh, with you. Thank you very much to one of you all, one and all. Thank you very much, Dr. Pedro Albahar with the floor. Now, Dr. Andre Rock from the division uh, for coordination of uh, Fear Chagas. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I want to thank you for the invitation to participate in this opening panel representing the translational program in Chagas disease. Few Chagas, I have the honor to be coordinating this program and have for three years. I want to greet everyone on the panel on behalf of the president, Nizia Trindade Lima. I also salute uh, the Osvaldo Cruz Institute and the editor-in-chief, Dr. Brandão, and the editors of this special edition of 113 years since the discovery of the Chagas disease. Uh, the commemorative edition, our dear friend, Juliana, quoted by Pedro, who coordinated with me, Fio Chagas, who passed away last year. Uh, the years of struggle that resulted in the creation of the world Chagas Disease Day in 2019. They brought visibility to this disease, especially because of the numerous events on this topic that have occurred in several different parts of the world. And April 14th, or close to it, it could make no different in Fiocruz, the birthplace of the discovery, and hundreds of researchers and students have studied and researched different aspects of the disease. Few uh, Chagas is celebrating two years when it's the oldest in number of participants with the largest translational program in Fiocruz where more than 100 researchers scattered across the 16 units of Fiocruz around Brazil, aspects ranging from parasite genome and the factors and reservoirs, uh, drugs, treatment, patient care, and the translational program ranging from the forest to the molecules, the transmission to uh, comprehensive treatment for patients. Three words, I think, define few shakas. Integration is the key word which we like to use, integration. and making a difference. Work networks through periodic meetings essential for discussing actions and understanding the demands under the unified health system when they happen, and communication through an open channel with the population, and a web page which is, provides information with people with the disease, researchers, and the general population that we invite to uh, learn about the disease. Uh, the cycle of lectures and the discussions on World Chagas Disease Day, bioproducts platform, strengthening the network of patients, nothing for us without us, establish integrated projects, diagnostic and serological kits, molecular kits, training, scientific dissemination are all products and themes which were born or at some and involved field crews in these 22 years. And that's how we've worked strengthening the successes in the 22 years and in seeking increasingly to innovate and to respond to the demands to treat the population and serve the population. The greatest tribute that we could make to people with this disease is to show that they're not alone. And Fiocruz has a commitment since 1909 with research, innovation, technological development, patient care, and ongoing training and information in Chagas disease. And that's what Fiocruz has worked with for 22 years with visibility to this theme, uh, seeking to consolidate the progress in this field and especially to strengthen the institutional commitment by Fiocruz to fight in the fight against Chagas disease. Congratulations to the IOC and that we all have a productive and fruitful day, an enjoyable day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Andre. 
Rocky, and now Dr. Mario de Gonzalez, the director of the Gonzalo Muniz Institute in the state of Bahia, the Fiocruz campus in Bahia. Good morning, one and all. For me, it is a huge pleasure to be here with you all. I would like to greet everyone who is part of this uh, opening round table and panel and greeting Dr. Nisi Trindade Lima, president of Fiocruz. It's a huge pleasure to be here in this seminar. And I want to greet the editors of the thematic, thematic series and the memoir history Osvaldo Cruz, the journal and to greet the speakers and organizers of the seminar, which will take place throughout the day, celebrating World Chagas Disease Day. Chagas disease, as was said, is a neglected disease. There are still separate different challenges to be uh, unveiled and overcome with regard to the Chagas disease, which for me, and it, for me, it's a huge pleasure to be here representing in this panel the researchers from the Gonzalo Muniz Institute in Bahia who conduct research in Chagas disease at the Gonzalo Muniz Institute I want to emphasize the history of Dr. Sonia Andrade, who is our researcher emeritus, and she was a pioneer in the studies on Chagas disease and became famous for her studies in Chagas disease, experimental studies in Chagas disease. Her scientific interest, Dr. Sonia Andrade, concerning the topic of Chagas disease was became manifest since the beginning of when she joined the pathology department where she produced in 1955, the first studies in co-authorship with Dr. Zilda Andrade, also a researcher and former director of our institute. So I highlight here these studies with the pathology of Chagas disease, the chronic cardiac form and the pathogenesis of chronic Chagas myocarditis, clinical manifestations they published respectively in the bulletin of the Gonzalo Muniz Foundation and also in the Brazilian Archives of Medicine. In the 1960s, her studies were consolidated on the different strains of T. cruzi and the vector uh, of the etiological agent resulting in an original in the Bayan uh, Medical Journal in 1960, proposing the classification of the strains according to the characteristics, biological and histopathological characteristics of the protozoan uh, biotypes, types one, two, and three. In the following decade, Dr. Sonia, she evolved with the research work in the field of experimental pathology and immunopathology of Chagas disease in different experimental models, expanding the focus of her work and, and their laboratory's work. So Dr. Sonia Andrade, I chose Dr. Sonia Andrade to be able to pay this tribute in the opening session because of her dedication in her research and her forming and training different researchers, including researchers who work in our institutes today, students, uh, young scientists, graduate masters and PhD students. So she was a pioneer in these pathological processes of Chagas disease and studying them and also in the response to drug therapy. So I salute Fiocruz and all of the participants for the event and for the work done in the, by their separate researchers in our institution and in Chagas disease. And I wish you all a successful meeting and a wonderful day and that we truly be able to make further progress in the future in the field of work and research and discoveries in research on Chagas disease. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marilda. I would now like to give a floor to Dr. Humberto Sena, the director of the Generation Institute in Fiocruz, Minas. Good morning, everyone. I would like to greet all the panelists. Dr. Roberto, sorry to interrupt you, but your camera is off. 
I'm so sorry. Oops. Now, yes. Thank you very much for letting me know. Please excuse me for this mix up. I would like to greet all the opening panel on behalf of our chair, Luisa Trindad Lima, and to greatly thank the invite to participate in this event and to remind you that the 14th of April is more than a date. It is more than a day. It summarizes 113 years of history started with a discovery of the, the disease discovered by Carlos Chagas discovered here in the state of Minas Gerais. The history continues to date with the work of scientific institutes and researchers dedicated to this illness. The Hene Hasho Institute in Fia Cruz Rinos, incorporated by Fia Cruz in 1970, already existed since 55, bringing together renowned scientists in the era of Chagas disease. Many of these researchers started their careers in the research center Emmanuel Diaz, which since 1970 is part of Fiocruz Minas. This was created in 1943 by IOC with the name of prophylaxis centers for Chagas disease. At the time, it was an unforeseen proposal. Under Emmanuel Diaz, the center developed important actions for prophylaxis, fighting focus, and clinical studies on the disease, which inspired scientific activities in Brazil and in Latin America. In 1963, Jean Carlos Pinto Diaz took on the head of the center, promoting the first program of epidemiological surveillance with community participation, which was facing the social aspects of Chagas disease. Jean Carlos, a scientist in the Hene Hacho Institute and an emeritus of research of the Valdo Cruz Foundation, became a worldwide reference in the research on epidemiology, clinics, diagnosis, and control of the disease, with important research on the populational dynamics and triatomics of the transmission cycle of T. Cruzi. Another research of the Institute coming through Bagui was José Pellegrino. Throughout his highlighted career, the scientists coordinated a series of activities on the astrology of Chagas disease and the fauna and experimental aspects of the Chagas uh, pathology and also tools for diagnosis and the standardization of antigens. And he is Emmanuel Gias, who he and Emmanuel Gias used for the very first time in Vacuiva BHC for the control of triatomines and establishing therefore the basis for the control of a vector of Chagas disease. Sigma Brenny, who invited by Professor Marchins, came to the Hene Hacho Institute, is another researcher who is worldwide renowned for his studies on Chagas disease. He was an author of important researches on the uh, disease, apart from the participation in approximately 600 drugs for the treatment of Chagas disease with medications used to date. He was also the founder of a report on Chagas disease in 1960 and established uh, great researchers as Atuniana Creci, Romania, Orlando, Orlindo Martins Filho, and Ricardo Gazzinelli, amongst many others. I'd also like to highlight in Hene Hachot's staff, Migeli de Artalucci, and a disciple of Jean Carlos as a specialist in Traptomines who has been developing a lot of important work in the control of a disease and who have intensively participated in identif identifying resistant vectors. Apart from that, the researchers uh, worked in many different others who have been working with a Chaga disease in Fiocruz Minas. But what we wish to highlight at this state in the crucial work of the Institute as a cluster of scientists dedicated to the study of this disease. Our research has had a global impact for us to understand, control the disease, the Chagas disease. The World Disease of Chagas, the World Chagas Disease Day is a collective effort of dedication and commitment of the science to the health of population of which Fio Cruz Minas is honored to participate in. Thank you very much once again, and I'd like to congratulate everyone who works with Chagas disease on the commitment of facing the challenges 
for the future control of Chagas disease. May this seminar be for us to have fruit for thought and manage inspiration. Thank you very much. Your microphone, Ines. Sorry, sorry again. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Roberto. And I would now like to give the floor to Dr. Tanya Araujo Jorge, the director. Good morning, everyone. I wish you can all see and hear me. I'm in a slightly more difficult situation for this uh, meeting, but I would like to initially greet all members of this panel in uh, the name of our president, Nisa Trindade Lima, and all the other directors who are with me sharing this session. It's a great honor to be able to represent once again all the researchers and research groups of Osvaldo Cruz Institute in an event of this size. The 14th of April is not only the day of a discovery, it is not only the World Chagas Day, it is a day which resulted from a very important struggle for us to be able to have global visibility on the cause of Chagas disease, on the issues of Chagas disease. It is more than a health, public health problem. It is something which is very complex already shown by Carlos Chagas in the time of discovery. To be today as a director of the Institute in this third mandate is a huge responsibility because the Institute works with topics which go way beyond Chagas. But Chagas, Chagas disease and Carlos Chagas legacy is very sensitive for all of us. In 1909, when we launched the Memories of Osvaldo Cruz Institute launched by Osvaldo Cruz. That was a first volume in which the discovery of Chagas disease was published, the characteristics of the parasite, and therefore volume one of 1909 is also the landmark of a Chagas disease discovery. And it is very good for us to be able to choose a series of a, a theme, but every year we may tell this topic we haven't had 100 years of discovery in 2009, but now we're doing another 13. Time never stops and time doesn't stop because our commitment and the debt we have with all the other 4 million people who are in Brazil and the others in the world, Brazil is a country with the highest number of people who are affected by Chagas disease with T. Cruzi. This is a commitment which is very important for all of us. So from this idea of the memoirs, which were very interesting, and I'd like to highlight this to all of our editors, I'd like to very quickly talk about three important landmarks. I can't highlight one or any specific researcher, but there are four names which are of great importance for us to remember on this very important date. The first is José Rodríguez Coro himself, who left us last year, not a victim of the pandemic, but a victim of of health, which for so long uh, had a process which was uh, involving many people. So I'd like to highlight Jose Rodriguez, uh, Professor Maria Gini, and Professor Henrique Lenzi, who made such important discoveries on the reservoirs. And I'd also like to highlight Dr. Maria Gina Zade Meirelles, who taught so many of us about the interaction. The name of these four researchers, I'd like to pay homage to all the researchers of the Institute that to date, research with Chagas disease. Apart from that, as our colleague of Hene Hashu has mentioned, Dr. Roberto Senna, the relationship between the Osvaldo Cruz Institute and all other institutes at Fio Cruz in this integrated research, as Andre Hossi mentioned, integration is a key word here. I would like to highlight that in year 2000, it was exactly in the year 2000 where this partnership and research between the Osvaldo Cruz Institute and the Hene Hashu Institute, which started the Kriyoshagas, uh, Dr. Sigmund Brenner, 
Dr. Ricardo Pazzinelli and Dr. Giovanni Gazzinelli, who were at the onset of a creation of this with uh, Dr. Rodrigo Correra de Oliveira and Dr. Maria de Nazaré Meirelles. So this was a very important moment for us. Another important moment I would like to highlight is the year of 2016, when based on a course for patients, for hosts, uh, for carriers, where carriers could meet apart from their office, the doctor's offices, they created in Rio de Janeiro Yoroshagas Foundation, which is the organization of civil society, which has the people who are affected, family members, carriers, healthcare professionals who are affected by this disease. Since then, we have permanent, a permanent fight which has contributed for us in 2020 for the World Health Organization's assembly to make the state an emblematic landmark for the entire world for us to have visibility for this cause. So it's with these words which I would like to highlight our honor of being here, as well as our commitment and year after year working to reduce more and more often the impact that this disease causes in the world, because this is a disease of a global spectrum, a global reach, but especially amongst Brazilians. So this is our homage, which we are making to the research and to the researchers and the meeting between the different organizations and the people affected to be the true center of debate, the true center of our attention. It has been very important, the entire control of the transmission through the, the main vector, the kissing bug uh, that we have, but above all, the control of the kissing bugs today is to make the integrated control together with the education and the awareness of people on this disease. So the focus on people who has taken 110 years in order to be concretely reached at the World Health Organization level, today that is what we have to work, we have to work on more often. So thank you very much for being here with us and for giving us the opportunity of having this uh, full day seminar as a legacy of Fiocruz, the Ministry of Health and the Institutes on the World Chagas Day Disease Day. Thank you very much, Dr. Trania. Now I'd like to give the word to Veloso, the director of the National Institute of Infectology of Andros Chagas. Good morning, everyone. And uh, the members of this opening session, the public, and it's a great pleasure for me to participate in the opening session of this event. And I'd like to congratulate the Osvaldo Cruz Institute, the editors and the memoir of Osvaldo Cruz Institute for the launch of this uh, series, which is a landmark of a World Chagas Day. We at our institute are very proud of maintaining the support to the patients with Chagas disease research and teaching. Our institute has an origin in the first the vision of Osvaldo Cruz, which always wanted to have a hospital inside Manguinho's campus. And we, in our history, the hospital was built. Osvaldo Cruz's dream became true exactly thanks to the discovery of Carlos Chagas on everything which he described regarding the Chagas disease, which from that moment onwards, a decree was issued by the president to build the, at the time, Osvaldo Cruz uh, Hospital, which was built exactly to research support patients with Chagas disease, and not that alone, but also to work in the prevention of Chagas disease. 
throughout Brazil. So today we are very proud of following and continuing the legacy of our pioneers. In Chagas disease, we have one of our main research lines. Today, what is it like to work with Chagas disease? We don't work with one disease. We work with people, with populations. These are populations which are neglected, populations which are vulnerable, and this is something which is a priority for us. And Chagas disease is one way for us to reach these populations with our work and to reduce the disease spread and to improve the quality of life of these people. We work uh, the researchers of Yovaldo Cruz Foundation and other international researchers in a vision of multidisciplinary work, multi-professional, and our work today has this aspect, and I'd like to highlight here two big projects which we are implementing, which is Integra Chagas and Cuida Chagas, led by André Silvestre, the Integra Chagras, which is a national collaboration, and Cuida Chagas is an international collaboration with uh, support from Univaiji, and we with that will be contributing for something which is also very dear to us, which is a priority for us in the Institute to work with a science of implementation. It is a way for us and for our work to reach the SUS, the Brazilian Public Healthcare System, SUS, to reach all of Brazil and now with this international support to take the national experience to bring that together with the work of experience of the people in other countries so that all of us together may contribute to fight Chagas disease, which continues to be a public health issue in the world, which is greatly neglected and this World Chagas Health Day contributes to give visibility to this problem. And it is a great uh, fact for us to see the participation of a community and the voice which is given to everyone for us to be able to see who are those who are affected and through their voices for them to help us and to tell us how we can help. So it is a great pleasure for us to be able to all be together today fighting against this disease, giving this public health issue visibility. And once again, I'd like to congratulate the Osvaldo Cruz Institute for this launch of this uh, series which records part of the work of all the researchers in Chagas disease, as this is something which is crucial for us to be able to face this disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Valdelea from the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Rodrigo Correa, now the Vice President for Research and Biological Collections of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, now has the floor. Good morning, one and all. I want to salute all the participants and the members of the opening panel and through President Nisa Tendaja Lima. I'm very happy to participate in this roundtable, especially because of the fact that we're celebrating a world Chagas disease. It's a silent disease in many parts of the world. And we want to know how many we are, where we are, and how many we are. That's the uh, how many p carriers there are of Chagas disease. It's one of the most important challenges. The 
program in 22 years that Fiocruz has worked heavily in the development of several different projects related to the vaccine, a vaccine diagnosis, identification of biomarkers, new drugs, a study of factors, social and educational aspects, which are extremely important for understanding this entire process and the Chagas disease. Chagas disease today, it still affects a significant number of people in the world, in addition to which we have observed a rebound of vector-borne Chagas disease, in addition to the well-known factors, which are the ones related to transmission, oral transmission, which is highly prevalent in the Amazon. Oral transmission in the Chagas disease program has been developed here at Fiocruz through the integration that we've achieved through the program, Fiochagas program, which led to the discovery of discovery or identification of important factors in the uh, Chagas disease. We can cite the use of biomarkers, which have are related to uh, the disease and the identification of these biomarkers. They are not easy to be used in, in a clinical practice, like other biomarkers that have been developed previously. Chagas disease today, in the context of the COVID pandemic, still has has to deal with the co-infection Chagas and COVID, which becomes a new challenge for our researchers at Fiocruz. Co-infection uh, T. Cruzi and COVID, uh, Juliana. Menezes led the Chagas disease program for several years at Fiocruz, leading to the study of several, the frontline studies at Fiocruz and the discussions, integrated discussions between our institution, the Pan American Health Organization, and the World Health Organization. I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said. I would like to again greet the, and salute the organizers, the Osvaldo Cruz Institute, and the journal Memorias for holding this event. Once again, thank you very much. And we wish you a successful event with the, over the course of today. Thank you very much, Dr. Rodrigo. And now with the floor, Professor Nizia Trindade Lima, the president of the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. Good morning, Inez. Good morning, one and all. I wish to greet the participants and salute the speakers in this event, which celebrates World Chagas Disease Day dedicated to carriers and patients with Chagas disease, all the colleagues, researchers and administrators who spoke before me. I wish to specifically salute Dr. Pedro Albajar, who struggled so tirelessly for the World Chagas Disease Day to become a disease. And I was in Geneva in 2019 when this decision was made by the World Health Assembly. I also greet Dr. Andre Roca, coordinator of the FIU Chagas program, my colleagues, administrators, Mario de Gonçalves, Roberto Araujo Jorge, Valdelea Valoz, Rodrigo Correa, uh, Vice President of Research. And I do not want to fail to greet here also Dr. Adeilton Brandão, editor of Memoirs, our journal of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute, and the panel members in the subsequent panels uh, with the participation of Ana Maria Huda Camargo, Elvira Hernandez, and coordinated by Guto Galvão, Luis Augusto Galvão from the uh, Fiocruz Global Health Center, CRIS. So it's important when we cite these, the format of this event, it, it's important to highlight that the motto, which is to know where we are and who we are, i.e. the Chagas disease patients, it's a motto since World Chagas Disease was established, it's a reference for us on, i.e., our relationship with the people affected directly by the disease. So this is the trademark, so to speak, of World Chagas Disease Day. So this meeting today includes scientific knowledge, 
associated and through the memorias, the journal links all this to the knowledge chain ranging from basic lab bench research to implementation as has been said and with a focus on people affected by the disease and by a neglected disease as we know and as has been said as well actually the disease it's a problem of thinking about neglected people more than actually a, a focus on uh illness, we should think of the people affected by this disease. That's why for me, it's a huge pleasure to participate in this opening panel where it was a veritable lecture and lesson, recalling all the pioneers, the men and women, especially as in the case of Dr. Sonia Andraji, who Marilda cited her and all of the researchers, women and men, who established this history of research, of a history of uh, achievements, but also some gaps in scientific knowledge and uh, uh, research which is so valuable in the struggle for public health by scientists and public health professionals who uh, have, still haven't been able to overcome this disease. We still have Chagas disease with us, not as a page, a beautiful page of achievements, but as a persistent problem to this day. With 7 million people affected by the disease in the world, 4 million of whom in Brazil. So on behalf of this tradition, this beautiful research tradition, which is a tra tradition in public health work and research in Chagas disease, we have a commitment as an institution focused on science and technology and response to the major health issues to be able to contribute to overcome this situation. And that's what we've been attempting to do as was discussed by all the previous speakers in research and development of diagnostic kits and search for new forms of treatment and new drugs, uh, something that can reduce the impact for people affected by the disease. I could not fail to mention here, certainly in, in the series, it will focus on the fact that Chagas disease research and the fight against Chagas disease has involved noteworthy contributions for scientific research both directly related to the disease, uh, disease, the transmission cycle and its impact, and all the way to spillovers in other research and other diseases. It was essential for developing molecular biology in the more recent period of history. For example, as is illustrated by the case of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute, it was extremely important for the development of cardiology and you know, by coincidence, as was mentioned here by Valdelay, we have a cardiologist heading two different important projects, Professor Andrea Silvestri, which are Integra Chagas and Cuida Chagas, these two projects. And we have a permanent program under our institution, uh, Ovidio Chagas, which was mentioned here by one of the coordinators, Andre Rocky and by Tanya Araujo Jorge. I believe that the citations to the tradition and the contemporary challenges are extremely important at this moment because it is a time, as Pedro has highlighted in his commentary and his opening greetings, to be able to overcome this persistent and extremely relevant public health problem, not only for Brazil, but elsewhere in the world, leading us to think both in biomarkers and in the markers, social markers of inequality. That was how at the time of the discovery by Carlos Chagas in 1909, that was how it was then. And it's still that way today. It's a, a disease that is heavily associated with uh, neglect for populations, especially rural population, but social inequality, socioeconomic inequality is important. The inequality revealed amongst other indicators in housing conditions and today and the issue of the invisibility and the need for an 
approach and treatment and care for people affected by the disease. I wish to conclude by citing two important aspects. I want to thank Pedro Albaja, who actually was the leader and pioneer today's session because Pedro, he intends and had the idea to be, make this series of articles that are being launched today in the Memorias to make this series in Memorias uh, to publicize these articles widely in English and Spanish. And so this is going to be a major contribution to increase the reach of this important series in the journal Memorias to focus on surveillance, to know where people are with the disease, to know who and how many they are and where they are. It's a focus on surveillance. Therefore, there was all the involvement in the organization of this event and our core division of health surveillance. I want to cite here our colleague Rivaldo Venancio for his contribution. Likewise, Pedro Bajar, Angela Junquera, who also are dedicated to organizing this seminar today, and also special acknowledgments to Simone Carafi, a researcher in Casa Josvaldo Cruz, who put great work into organizing this seminar. Also, in addition to Adenilton Brandão, director of Memorias, the colleagues who organized Pedro Albajar, Angela Junqueira, and Wilson Savino. Certainly today will be a day of the possibility for having access to this broad panel in this series of articles in Memorias. And with this publicity, we're making a further scientific contribution of the utmost importance. I wish to recall here that in 1909, in August 1909, in the first volume of the journal Memorias, which was cited here in the opening session, the article by Carlos Chagas demonstrates this strong relationship between scientific journals, periodicals, and science dissemination, and knowledge dissemination, and the establishment of scientific knowledge, building such knowledge. It's difficult to dissociate this history of the journal Memorias of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute and Chagas disease, and likewise, the elucidation of Chagas disease with this journal, this hundred century old journal, Memorias, was a fundamental pillar for this knowledge production. So today is a special day of establishing bridges and networks and strengthening the networks that our institution in collaboration with all so many other institutions in Brazil and in the world have established. I also wish to thank the World Health Organization for all its support for this initiative through Dr. Pedro Albahar. And I also wish, by way of conclusion, to mention and highlight that actually Chagas disease is, it's a cuts across so many different institutes within our institution or in the foundation because it had a fundamental weight in the very the scientific development and in, in the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. This construction, this process seeking scientific excellence and simultaneously responding to the most relevant public health challenges in the time uh, in the age of the COVID-19 pandemic, as Rodrigo Correa, Correa uh, reminded us, new challenges have emerged, including co-infection, T. cruzi and SARS-CoV-2, and also difficulties for approaching a number of public health issues in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, uh, reaffirming the commitment to continue important programs like Fio Chagas, the strengthening projects like Integra Chagas, Cuida Chagas, and uh, with the support of UNITAID, uh, 
it's necessary at this moment to reaffirm this commitment. I wish to uh, send a warm embrace to everyone, and especially mentioning our friend who's passed away, Jose Rodriguez Cora and Julia de Medes, two generations who represent much of the world work with regard to Chagas disease. A uh, warm embrace for everyone, and we hope you have a wonderful event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Nizia Trindad Lima. We thank everyone for participating, all the authorities in this opening panel, and I'll turn the floor over to Dinto Brandão, Editor-in-Chief of Memorias, who will give his lecture on Chagas disease and memorias, a long-standing tradition and collaboration. Good morning, one and all who are attending here this session. I am Deilton Brandão, and uh, this special day, World Chagas Disease Day, I want to begin by stating emphatically and thanking, acknowledging the organizers of this event for the opportunity and especially the challenge of making a brief, uh, using a narrative to use a, a popular term today, a narrative on this relationship or connection, this close connection, extremely close connection, highly close connection between the journal Memorias do Instituto Oswaldo Cruz and Chagas disease. Our journal, it may sound odd, to talk about a close relationship or a close connection between a scientific journal and a given disease or biological event, uh, because, and what kind of connection does it mean? A direct connection or link, but there a, was a series of historical facts or events which point and converge on this connection, and that's basically what I wish to narrate here and tell a report to be able to share and consolidate this idea, uh, which is, has been there at least 113 years, this close relationship between our journal, Memorias, and Chagas disease. It all began in 1907, actually. That year, 1907, Osvaldo Cruz uh, put Carlos Chagas in charge of uh, gave him the mission of going to Minas Gerais and through this mission to two years later, he announced the discovery of a new disease, which he called a new tri American trypanosomiasis, the title of the article in the journal in the Memorias in 1909. The article was written in Portuguese and in German Memorias has this detail that ever since the beginning of the journal, the journal was concerned with using the uh, lingua franca, it was German at that time. So many of the articles were translated into German to be able to disseminate the knowledge. In 1907, that same year, in December 1907, a decree was published by the federal government in Brazil at the time, which, amongst other things, created the journal Memorias, and the decree said the following. Uh, through the memoirs of the Memorias, well, they will be publishing articles and studies by the Osvaldo Cruz Institute. When the articles are concluded, there's a reference, the decree itself referred to the fact that later became the name of the journal, Memorias, or Memoirs. I'm referring to the name Memorias because when the journal was created, officially created, there was, in general, in the world, there were few scientific journals compared to what we have today, which there are more than 30,000, some people estimate 50,000 scientific journals worldwide, which is pretty amazing and it's important because over the course of the years the journal became and evolved accompanying 
publishing trends as happened in other journals, there was a change of the name to adjust to the period of these new trends. But this uh, journal Memorias uh, kept its name, which is today a an uh, unmeasurable value brand. And there has been a period in which I personally was favorable to a name change to be able to adjust it to this new period. But due to an event, uh, uh, let's say a collateral event of a growth of the editorial market, which was the appearance of uh, predatory journals, I would no longer recommend, and I don't think anyone else would think about promoting a change in the name of a journal because this is a brand which is very peculiar, which puts the journal Memorias at a specific level, which differentiates it from any other journal in terms of presentation. Because we has, have a name in Portuguese, which is a very rare aspect uh, in those which have a global reach, as is the case of uh, the journal Memorias. And this is something which is a brand which has to be kept. This is something which has happened in 1907, the creation of this journal officially. But the operation of the journal was only happening in 1909 with its first issue which was published in April of 1909, which will be part of that autonomous volume, as it was called at the time, in which we would later uh, me, uh, publish in 1907, he, Carlos Chagas goes to Minas Gerais, and two years later, he consolidates all of that work. He had already pre-promoted this uh, in another journal, but the true uh, journal from the scientific standpoint and all the details which would be with him and which would also always be following Chagas' disease was in fact published in August uh, 2009. Therefore, we have these first moments where the people who were involved in the discovery of Chagas' disease or of the initial conditions which allowed all the work of a discovery were the same people who, in a certain way, who created the journal or who gave notoriety to the journal in 1909. And as all big discoveries, and especially discoveries made by young journalists, uh, remember that Carlos Chagas in 1909 was only 30 years old. If we compare that to the current situation, at 30 years of age, most of the researchers in Brazil are finishing or have just finished their PhD, just about to finish their PhD. The average age is from 28 to 31 years of age, which means that this was truly phenomenal work for a young researcher to make a discovery of this nature. And as is very common in the history of science, big discoveries, those which promote changes in the way people think and changing the concepts and the discovery of Chagas disease causes this, it exactly brings all of these situations. Carlos Chagas suffered some resistance. There were members of the National Medicine Academy who were against or did not believe that, did not believe in the relationship between T. Cruzy and the clinical result of that infection, which we today know as Chagas disease. So for some years, the Chagas uh, discovery was uh, questionable. Uh, it wasn't fully accepted. And this is something which will change or starts to change at the end of 1920 when a Brazilian, uh, sorry, an Argentine uh, doctor, Salvador Massa, in one of the provinces, in one of the poorest regions in Argentina, he starts a series of studies and evidence. And at the end, 
he rewrites or he makes the same discovery as Carlos Chagas, making the same associations of a, a T. Crozy, which affects, contaminates people that live in a specific social standard, which are very close or very similar to what Carlos Chagas found in Minas Gerais. And finally, in 39, the situation becomes uh, more or less established and Chagas disease is accepted by the scientific society and is recognized as another one of the diseases or one of the other illnesses which make up the panel of medicine or of tropical medicine of which it is strongly related to. This is something is to show this uh, journal, Memorias, follows a trajectory which is in parallel to these discoveries. During those, during these 113 years of operation, so let's consider not exactly uh, in April of 09, of 1909, the journal published, I'm not uh, sure what the exact number is, but I think it's over thousands of articles dealing with the many different topics of Chagas disease, the parasites, the vectors, the epidemiology, as well as other causes and other situations which are associated to the Chagas disease research. When we look at the journal, or better said, when we look at a timeline of the Memorias journal, considering its first issue in 1909 until the current times, it is possible for us to define two big periods of editorial operation of a way in which the journal operated at that time. So we have a moment which goes from 1909 until approximately 1980, or, or better said, until 86, uh, which there's a small detail there because between 76 and 80, between 76 and 1980, the journal published nothing. In reality, it was uh, nearly going extinct or, or bankrupt when a journal doesn't publish anything, it is basically, let's say, bankrupt or, or going broke. Then in 79, Professor José Rodríguez Gora takes on the Osvaldo Cruz Institute as the president, and he literally rescues the journal Memorias of the Osvaldo Cruz Institute. This is a very important event because the journal we have today that we all are very well aware of, it is essentially a rescuing uh, what Professor Mora has done in 1980. So until that date, until the end of the 70s, the Memorias journal was essentially, but not exclusively, an institutional uh, magazine, a journal, better said. So to remember when the journal was created, it was very common between the research institutes, uh, not all of them, but most of them, to have their own, uh, an example could be the Pasteur Institute, which also had a journal, which was called the Annals of the Institute, uh, Pasteur Institute, Anais Instituto Pasteur. The name has changed, but just to adapt to this new scenario, so then we could ask, why is it that the, the, the journal, why wasn't it called the uh, Annals of the Instituto Cruz or just the Journal of Instituto Cruz, uh, Osvaldo Cruz, but that uh, decree of 1907 opened a possibility for the creation of a brand which uh, definitely who thought of that name wasn't foreseeing that it would be so distinct uh, a century later, but that is a reality. So with this uh, rescue, which Professor Mora did in 1980, as of 1980, the journal takes on its uh, international face, 
it was already an international journal in the sense that its articles could be read by researchers or better said by people in other regions of the world but it didn't have that characteristic that wasn't something which was editorially defined as an editorial uh, policy professor Mora does exactly that the focus of the journal was always the uh, human infectious diseases despite there was a moment in which uh, they also published topics issued to uh, veterinarian uh, medicine or veterinarian parasites but the journal now has a more strict focus to infectious to human infectious diseases which obviously isn't that uh, strict let's say the issue of uh, human infectious diseases is very broad and has many different variables so much so that it is still something very broad but at least now there is a definition the human infection as an editorial focus this relationship these two periods i have mentioned they can be in aligned all of them because those three images these three uh characters which i have mentioned here as valdo cruz creates the journal carlos chagas who publishes his uh, monumental work and then carlos chagas himself uh, which published this he was a director of the osvaldo cruz institute at least implicitly and professor rodriguez uh, who amongst many other activities uh, he did all the activities in chagas disease in the last two years he did many activities and many different papers in the amazon doing uh, what carlos chagas also did so here there is a connection the elements which i have mentioned which justify or at least allow us to think about this connection I would also add to that, to those elements, another important factor, which is that despite uh, Professor Goro having done this uh, rescuing the journal and giving it the conditions for it to project itself even more internationally and to truly become a global journal, but it didn't adopt uh, the English language, which uh, to all effects, English is the language of science, uh, despite of uh, many controversies in that sense. But at least in biomedicine, that's how things more or less uh, operate. But until 89, the Memorias Journal was also publishing uh, articles in Portuguese. And while this was not a problem for many of the people who were working in that area of the journal but as an international journal this is something which definitely limited its reach because at that time at the end of the 80s we didn't have as we have today tools which allow us to uh, have trans simultaneous translations in real time of any text any language if this trend this technological trend continues to facilitate communication in any language it might be that in the near future the journals throughout the world will start publishing again in their national languages uh, possibly that is something which i believe if we consider the technological evolution at one time who knows memoritas will be able to publish articles in portuguese or in spanish if uh, the authors wish to do so as most of the publish of uh, the authors in the memorias are majority and above all are uh, article articles published by authors in latin america so this is a very important journal for articles published in latin america we also publish articles from authors in other parts of the world but memorias today is a uh, publication which is very much used by researchers in latin america so this scenario of memoirs which was publishing these articles in 89 as a coincidence uh, with an editor 
Eli Garcia, the biochemist who was also the president of Fiocruz in 1989, he makes the decision of uh, the fact that Memorias Journal would only publish its articles in English, and that has been the case since that time. And the coincidence is that Eloy Garcia is also a researcher in the bigger field of Chagas disease. He studied for many, many years and trained people also in work uh, that was very specific and also of a T. Cruzi. So this is another important event in the history of the Memorias Journal, which is uh, triggered by a researcher, which is in one way or other connected to the Chagas disease research. So we have these four events which shape, which create, which project, which rescue and shape the current journal. I usually mention that if, uh, if we have to list the most important characters for the journal, I have no question whatsoever but it would be those three people, Osvaldo Cruz, Carlos Chagas, and Professor Kubra, who, in fact, brings back the journal. In conversations which I have had directly with Professor Kubra, he gave me these details when he said that literally he was rescuing the journal. So if it weren't for this activity, we probably... Stagio. We probably wouldn't have Memorias today because it would be at a stage of many, many difficulties and basically without a possibility of uh, circulating again. But uh, luckily, we continue with the journal thanks to what the visionary uh, actions, as he was a very visionary person. Let me just uh, make a small interruption here in the story to create, uh, to include in this chronology of the Memorias Journal to mention an event which Memorias Journal participated in and was in a certain manner helped to drive. And personally, I have participated in this event because at the time I was doing my PhD and I was involved with part of the tasks of a network which is uh, set up. I'm talking about the research network made up by labs or researchers of basically all of Latin America that had as an objective uh, the sequencing of the T. Cruzi genome. This network initially had a first meeting here at Fiocruz in 1994 to define what would be the uh, organisms to be sequenced. T. Cruzi and Leshmania and uh, I think another four or five others which were important, which would then appear as the agents of some of the diseases which were neglected, which were then defined as neglected diseases. This network starts to operate in 95 each lab had a certain task at the time. At the time, the lab I was related to, which was managed by our colleague and researcher here, the Osvaldo Cruz Institute, uh, Dr. Degard, who was also my supporter at that time, who was sequencing the, the expect sequence tax in the English language. And the objective was for each lab to each research group to make a contribution. And at the end for all of that to generate a genome of T. Cruzi and for the strain which was uh, selected for that study at the time, uh, a clone of the strain, which was a uh, homage to another big research of Chagas disease, Professor Zygmunt Brennan of uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais. And The CL clone was renamed as CL Brenum, and that was uh, therefore the clone which was chosen for the sequencing of the T. Cruzi genome. I'm mentioning this event here because there was an historical component to it. 
all of the countries in Latin America are participating. Virtually all of the Latin American countries have Chagas disease from Mexico to Argentina to the Teja do Fogo. They were all represented, the researchers from each of these countries. And obviously, Fio Cruz played a central role, uh, an important role in this network. Not only Fio Cruz, the the University in Minas Gerais, the University of Sao Paulo, and the Federal University in Sao Paulo. At the end of the day, the event did not happen as we expected or hoped. There are reasons, obviously, for that. There was a technological technical reason at the time. The sequencing technology, which was basically the Sanger method, but automated this then. It was not particularly adequate to quickly sequence the genome. It was appropriate, but we needed a, an absurd amount of funding and technological researches, which were not available at the time, not even for the major large laboratories in the world, and much less here. So in addition to which this kind of initiative required constant input of funding, the National Research Foundation here, CNPQ, worked initially, some international agencies and few crews contributed with some funding, but the result was that these funds were insufficient to conclude the work. And also given the technical issue, and there is another detail at the time, nobody knew, we could not imagine that the C.L. Brenner clone is a hybrid. And the result, uh, so this association of two different ancestral strains that presented two different population groups for T. cruzi and the result is the it's a difficult to sequence this genome with the technology that existed at the time. We have sequencing technology that could do this quickly. Now, there's a new technology called nanopox sequencing. It fits in your pocket so you can sequence things relatively quickly. But unfortunately, at the time, that network, which in my assessment, was a beautiful example of how researchers in Latin America could and can organize for a common objective or goal functioned for about six years, approximately six or seven years. And during this period, a lot of results were produced and the memorias are journal in 1997, the journal, our journal published, in other words, at the time, the editor, if I'm not mistaken, our colleague now, who is retired already, Human Momen, he was the editor at the time, and they published a series, a special series of articles on the Genome Project for T. Cruzai. It was several different articles by several different research groups, and which was published in 1997. In 1997 was when it was published. This was another piece of evidence of the close relationship between the journal Memorias and the Chagas disease. Over the course of the decades in Chagas disease research, so I spoke and said at the beginning that this could have been an opportunity. And in fact, if the T. cruzi genome had been entirely sequenced by this laboratory's network of Latin American laboratories, this network, it would have been an interesting conclusion, an historically, symbolically relevant conclusion, because Carlos Chagas began the research cycle in 1909, and the publication of Carlos Chagas opened up several different cycles, research cycles in Chagas disease. When we read the article that or reread the article. I've read this article. If you've read it two or three times, you certainly be surprised every time you reread it because of the how current and contemporary the issues are that are cited in the article. They're numerous. Although Carlos Chagas was not explicit with those issues, but when we look at from the looking back on it from the 21st century and that information in the early 20th century, we realized that there is a long and unwinding road for 
basic research on T. cruzi and will certainly lead to a dis some discovery which will alter the course of the management or control of Chagas disease, but it's essential for us to to have basic research on T. cruzi and this historical cycle, which is launched, one of these cycles could have been concluded here. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen. The genome was finally sequenced and published in 2005 in an article in Science, which included participation by several different Brazilian researchers. I think in an event today, we're going to have some of the people that participated in this, who collaborated in this article in Science in 2005, but we have the merit. And when I'm talking about the method, I'm going to be talking about the effort it was necessary. This financial effort came from the national NIH in the United States, which finally managed to provide the funding for this sequencing and to convene a group of researchers who finally published the genome of T. Cruz. I was launched in 2005 for us individuals researchers here, and I specifically. It was a time, a great time, because I was able to uh, uh, use this for several different parts of my research in T. Cruzai, but as a participant in this network and researchers and researchers for the T. Cruzai genome in Latin America, there was a, some frustration. It was rather bittersweet in that sense, because at some moment we held several different meetings during that period, and we fed our hope and fueled our hope that we could finally make this effort here in Brazil. And personally, I, at the time, I wasn't part of the editorial board of the journal, and I didn't even imagine that I might be, but I expected that the main article could have been published in Memorias precisely in order to conclude, uh, symbolically, take the full circle of one of these cycles that Carlos Chagas launched, but that's not how things happen in practice. I see that uh, time is short, but I want to cite another aspect, which also makes this connection. It's the fact that since 1974, there has been a meeting of basic research in Chagas disease in Kashambu, and it changed, but now it's back to Kashambu in the state of Minas Gerais, and for some time after retrieving the Memorias, I don't know exactly the date between the mid 1980s until approximately the mid 1990s. Memorias published, published at that time, the abstracts sent to this Congress in addition to all the lectures that were given at the Congress on under this heading. So this is further evidence of this close connection between Memorias, because to this day we have this meeting of basic research in Chagas disease, which continues to this day, the annual meeting in the journal Memorias also had its collaboration in this scenario has changed. Unfortunately, it's not possible to continue serving uh, to the Congress as it could have been. So today the Congress, the Congress uses other mechanisms to be able to publicize its work and also serves the objectives and meets the objectives of the participants. My time, I believe, is already running out, so I'm going to conclude. And I wish to once again thank the organizers of the event and specifically the editors, the associate editors of our journal, Julia Junqueira, Wilson Savino, Pedro Albajar, and our dear friend, Julia Juliana Demes, who unfortunately passed away from COVID last year. We had a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings to deal with this special series. So I know it was huge, a huge effort, a huge effort. That is why at the beginning I said emphatically, because it's not easy to convene so many experts, and especially in the last two years, which we experienced a number of uh, atypical situations during the pandemic. So by conclusion, I want to use a biological metaphor, which summarizes, I believe, and expresses this close connection between the journal and Chagas disease. It's the journal memoirs 
is umbilically linked to Chagas disease, so to speak, using that biological metaphor of the umbilical cord. Thank you, Dr. Adeilton Brandão. I'll turn the floor over now to Dr. Luis Augusto Galvão from the Fiocruz Global Health Center, who will present the following lectures, after which the presentations for commentary. Thank you very much, Inés. On behalf of President Nisa Trindade, I want to greet our colleagues who are participating in this activity. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here. When I joined Fiocruz in 1978, I was closely associated with Professor Joaquin Cardoso de Mello and also Hortensia because I'd worked a lot with Rosinha in Chagas disease in Minas Gerais. So this area historically has been connected to my own background in public health. So it's a huge pleasure to come back. Again, it's an area that I saw grow from a problem, a local problem a re to a regional problem to a global problem, which today it is. And when the director of uh, sustainable development in the PAHO, I had the pleasure to support the development of this program. So for me, it's a huge pleasure to be here. And it's an even bigger pleasure to invite Ana Maria Ahuda Camargo from the Association of Chagas Disease Patients and Carriers from Minas and President of the International Federation of Associations of Persons Affected by Chagas Disease, Cindy Chagas. It's a pleasure and you're welcome, Ana Maria. It's a huge pleasure to have you here with us and we we'll take advantage of the opportunity to greet Elvira Dalia Cuevas Idalia from the Mexican Association of Persons Affected by Chagas Disease from Mexico and president of Finde Chagas. Welcome, Edvide Cuevas, who we know as Adalia, who is a fighter and an activist in the issue of Chagas disease. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Madam Ana Maria Cajuda Camargo for her presentation, after whom we will hear Italia. It's a pleasure, and you have the floor. Good morning, one and all. It's a pleasure to be here, Dr. Augusto Galvão. It's a, thank you very much for joining with us in this activity. And I wish to salute everyone by way of President Nisia Trindade de Lima of Fiocruz and salute all of the individuals and the members of Fiocruz by uh, Dr. Angela Juquera, the who organized the of the scientific organizing committee. And I want to take advantage of the opportunity to state that it's an honor to be here in Fiocruz, Fiocruz with such fantastic scientific production. Uh, it's so important in defense of life, in defense of people. It's an extremely important role during the pandemic in education and training, and especially in health care. So for me, it's a huge honor to be here today. I have a PowerPoint presentation, but if it's difficult, I can speak off the cuff. Okay. Can we see my slides? Actually, I am part of the scientific board of the Association of Persons with Chagas Disease in Campinas and the advisory board of Finde Chagas, the International Federation of Persons with Chagas Disease. Okay, for us to talk about the International Federation of Associations of Persons Affected by Chagas Disease, we have some parameters that we need to address which are the pillars first because it is a civil society organization so they are persons who are the persons as individuals but as individuals as collective bodies and the definition of the collective subject defending a common good common purpose a cause transcending this role of just the individual role and also 
the result of this is collective constructs or association movements and the principles of democracy. Democracy, i.e. encompassing rights, uh, conquest and defense of existing rights, the conquest of further rights, especially in the context of a disease. Uh, it's been known for 113 years, has been discussed with so many persistent challenges, which unfortunately are still part of the, it's still part of the neglected diseases. <laughs> and the definition, an important concept in the Federation, Finde Chagas, that health is a social good. It's a right and not um, merchandise. Health is the defense of life, defense of quality of life. In a word, it's the defense of principles which preserve human beings in the most comprehensive sense. And talking about the Federation Findus Chagas, since it is a civil society organization, the Federation is autonomous and independent. It does not mean that it does not establish partnerships and links and ties, but it needs to be independent nevertheless in this process. Here we have a timeline in, by, in the afternoon. It's going to be discussed in greater detail in the afternoon. It's been discussed extensively the issue of memories or memoirs as the name of the journal, Memorias. One of the articles talk about this thematic series since 1909. It's a timeline here as well with all the milestones in terms of the communication of the publication by Carlos Chagas until the first movements that were organized around the world, after which the movement uh, here of the associations under the Finde Chagas Federation. So I'd like to issue an invitation for everyone to be able to study this timeline in greater detail in this article, actually, which is going to be part of the discussion in the afternoon. Here in the International Federation Finde Chagas, we selected several different milestones some of the milestones in this process and the creation of the Found Federation. It was created in 2009, and this arrow is exponential. And these smaller arrows mean the movement, means the movement with conquests, contradictions, achievements, difficulties as well. And it's a movement, it's not something static and time or doesn't mean there are no challenges on the contrary. And so the first milestone was this first meeting of patients. Patients here, we're using the term patients, but I prefer to use the word users rather than patients, people that use the services. I prefer the term users rather than patients for the first meeting in the Americas and Europe and Western Pacific in Uberaba, which resulted in the Charter of Principles. This Charter of Principles in 2010 was part of the foundation. The first assembly was also the Charter, which was the bylaws for with the objectives, purposes, and principles. Uh, fin de Chagas, our federation in this first moment in 2009, there are eight different associations, uh, increased to 12 later. And in 2012, they had a second assembly, was the uh, declaration of April 14, a uh, recommendation by our assembly, by the set of persons at the time already represented organized movements. So it represented 13 different associations. So we voted for this World Chagas Disease Day, a recommendation to be submitted to a point by 
recommended by the associations that comprise the federation. In 2013, and also with a decision for this statute to be registered. And in 2013, we have a landmark, which was the records. The records of this uh, statute doesn't only mean legislation, but it goes way beyond this. It is something which exists with little recognition within a set of legislation but something that uh, the laws, they are living because people have to make them living. So they need for them to have uh, issues of legitimacy, funding, but we need this uh, legitimacy. In 2014 and 2015, because this is an international alliance of uh, the organization of patients. This is something which was in Santa Cruz de la Sierra with 16 associations. So there was a huge growth. And this means that this federation with uh, the, these members could also have a seat when uh, holding World Health Assemblies, a very important step. And that apart from having all of them in the World Assembly, apart from having all the representations, many times the top uh, uh, representatives of the countries, for you to have the voice of the people who truly represent organized civil society. 2016 is when we have the approval of the reinstatement of a series of principles in the sense of ethics, of values, of democratic management, and the contradictions, these movements, uh, they represent these contradictory movements, the difficulties of understanding of uh, the individuals, the roles of power, of association, of the collective, and of this sharing of power, which are things that uh, uh, include our society. Then in 2018, we have the 15th of a fifth assembly, and we have an important step, the important landmark, which is the change of a statute. The change of a statute in which sense? These statutes. Uh, as I mentioned, they were recorded in 2013 here in Brazil, in the city of Campinas. And let's say they have what the Brazilian Civil Code establishes for the civil society organizations. And it establishes that terminology of a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, a fiscal board, and other boards which are also interested in uh, looking at this from the scientific standpoint. And the importance of this change came from the fact of having more shared management to have uh, the presidency in the Brazilian legislation, I believe that is the case in many other legislations, has a legal representation. And someone who uh, legally is here in Brazil with uh, all their status of being able to exercise this uh, legal entity representing the association, or it is someone uh, who is Brazilian. And we consider it as important, this was a very lengthy debate which took place, we considered that this is something that could be shared. And that is why we saw the solidarity in, at the level of a presidency. We worked this issue very strongly, and we were able to see an advance in 2021, which was for us to reformulate the statutes, an advance which the legal consultancy told us that would be an advance. This creates a jurisprudence which is interesting and important because it opens a path for you to have a presidency, which is that formal one, 
which is uh, all the formality of the assemblies, the meetings, the bylaws, and the minutes of the meetings, and the other, which is one with solidarity, which Ilvira is already part of that, and that is something which legally, let us say, brings a legitimacy. So this was a very significant uh, step forward. Next slide, please. Here, I have a table with all the details of all of these assemblies, all of the locations, the venues, and here in more detail, as it's not the case here, but I brought this for it to be available for you. In each assembly, what was the agenda, what were the decisions, and the most important frameworks. I try to, in a few minutes, list some of the most important ones. And I would just like to come back here to this timeline, not going back to it, but referring to it. In 2019, there's a landmark, which is not a landmark of a Finji Chagas itself, but it is a landmark for the promotion of the World Chagas Disease Day. And that that day has a participation, an active participation of Fingi Chagas and which triggers processes and some social political aspects such as triggering as of 2012 to have a driver to mobilize some associations in their municipalities and in their territories to bring legitimacy to this legislation. We have three laws and we have a state law also, which is related to the day of a person or the Chagas Disease Day. So this is also important framework of what the association triggers. This is just an example, and there are many at a global level also, which the Federation was uh, developing to mobilize all the associations. Next, please. The next slide, it also tells us about the sixth assembly, which is an assembly which was fully virtual with an organization which uh, went way beyond the borders. And despite not having this human contact, uh, which is very important, it made it possible for us to expand the participation. So I believe this was a big uh, result, a big positive result in the possibility of us uh, including many people to participate while it was in person, there's an issue of the funding, of the costs, and many times uh, there were always two representatives. Next, please. Here are some of the strengths which I uh, mentioned. There are some, but there are also others, and here, when we expand the network, which is that timeline, which the timeline shows, the shared management of the chair of the meetings which are held in articulation with organizations. There are many challenges. Here, I also leave this uh, for Elvira to mention, but here I would like to highlight these uh, challenges which are more in the collective role the individual has which is always a task of many hands and many concepts, let's say, to be able to live with a diversity of cultures and languages. This is something which is a very big learning curve, and this also becomes a challenge. If we look at the photos, which uh, think about 2012, of this uh, arrow, which starts very small in 2009, a small meeting, and uh, this over time was expanding. We also count on the participation of 20 associations. Here, 
If we were to think about the methodology which we always work on, which uh, is the issue of uh, the wheel, the issue of people, of uh, people facing each other. The symbol of an image which starts very small and it is very uh, open, the, the wheel is very small and it's small and it goes increasing, increasing and people being able to join. It is not something which is closed, it is open. And it is something which is always very inclusive. I always like this example of a wheel and I bring Professor Gaston of uh, Wagner de Souza Campos, which was the president of Abrasco two mandates ago and who I find very dear and I always learn a lot from him, as well as uh, many professionals who today uh, were uh, speaking here today. And the Findi Chagas uh, was set up with a wheel as a democratic space, a way to make a co-management uh, active but to keep the wheel turning, always moving forward. So it's not something which is at a standstill. It is something which always gives us this idea of movement and movement has challenges, has contradictions, uh, has many advances. But despite that, there are still many challenges, many challenges post pandemic the pandemic brought uh, much greater vulnerability. I'm a social worker and I know how much we in our work have been working with a vulnerability, with a reduction of the rights of uh, policies, which were policies of the state, which become government policies with a benefit of a continued support, which is something which is very important especially for the people with Chagas disease. So we also think of not having to face a war as we are seeing. We return to some of these things of uh, what was seen uh, in barbaric times. So it is very important for us to always have this concept of the respect uh, of rights of others. So I'd like to wrap up here and I hope to be able to continue in this uh, journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Ana Maria, thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you very much for building this wheel, this living wheel, which grows and grows and which is so very important uh, in fighting Chagas disease. Thank you very much. I would now like to give a floor to Ms. Elvira Idalia Hernandez Cuevas. Welcome. Thank you very much, Idalia, as I all know her. And I would now like to give a floor to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of those of us with a disease to be able to express our feelings and what we see on a daily basis in our daily work. My name is Elvira Idalia, and I am greeting you from uh, Mexico. And I'm really very pleased to be able to participate with you in this very important event of Fio Cruz. Thank you very much, and I'd like to greet all of you. So, fin de Chagas, as you can see there at the beginning, my name is Elvira Idalia. And I'm currently also the president of AMEPASH Mexico, which is an association which we set up in 2012, of which I was a founding member. And therefore, I would like to thank all people who at this time are helping us. And also the presidency, the solidarity presidency of Finde Chagas. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as Ana Maria had already mentioned, and we are currently 30 associations in 13 countries of the world. So we have them all listed here and we have a website where we have this map, which everyone may look at 
and obtain information on where these associations are located. Next slide. And as Ana Maria mentioned in 2009 in the city of Uberaba, Brazil, we have Finde Chagas in 2020. Our motto was, let's make the Chagas disease visible. Many will ask why as of 2020, if it was born in 2009, because it's as of 2020, when we, after having requested from the WHO, where we have our headquarters in the year of 2019, in the 72nd assembly, we are granted the World Chagas Disease Day. So therefore, it's on the 14th of April as of this year, when we can remind, uh, remember of all people affected by the disease. So let's remember this first motto, which is let's make the Chagas disease visible. Before this, we were ignored, left alone, non-supported. And as of COVID, we now seem to be invisible, and that is what we want to fight. In 2021, our motto is a calling attention to the full and universal attention of those who are affected by Chagas disease. Here, we requested above all things, a diagnosis, a treatment and follow-up of the disease in order to have a dignified care as people who we are in the world. In 2022, our motto is help us to know how many we are and where we are. Here, what we are requesting is uh, the reporting of cases and epidemiological surveillance, which is something which is permanent. And uh, please excuse me because the slides have lost their, their template. Thank you very much. The next, please. When we asked for the reporting of the epidemiology, we are referring to the diagnosis for the treatment of the people who are affected by the disease. But this might lead us to stop the transmission forms, which we currently have. We know that some countries already have these rules in place for the mandatory reporting and epidemiological surveillance of the chronic cases. In all of those countries, I would like to mention two, which I do not want you to think that we are generalizing. In other words, what I'm going to be giving as an example now is not something which is general in both countries, but it is something which is taking place. The first example I'd like to give you is last year. Last year, a person in Ecuador reached out to us with, at Fin de Chagas to ask us for information about uh, their treatment. This person had 72 days taking a Furtimox and a physician who was taking care of a person said, you will not stop taking the Furtimox until you become negative. I got shocked. I said, no, that is not possible. So before becoming negative, this person will be dead. As of that moment, we seek information. And it was Dr. Sergio Sosa who helped and said how the treatment should be managed. And it was Dr. Maria Anselmi who helped us also to talk to the physician to take away the medication and to follow the treatment. In other words, we had to give that information to find allies for this information. And then in Mexico, there approximately four months ago, a girl was positive for Chagas disease when there was a rapid test made. She was living in the capital city of the state. So I told her, you have to go to the health management. There they told her that they did not make those tests for Chagas. So I said, great, so let's find the health center, which is closest to your home. Because someone has to take a blood sample and therefore to study the test for Chagas. She was told that that was not done and they didn't know what they were talking about. So let's go to a regional hospital. And in the regional hospital, they told her, no, we don't make these tests here and we don't know what to do. So what did Amepash do in this case, as it was in Mexico? 
we spoke to the secretariat and we asked him to please have special care with this girl. So here, what we can support is that information is not held by all the health centers or even all the physicians who take a care at any level or in any place, be it a small center, big center. There are many physicians who still lack knowledge on this disease. Therefore, the question is, uh, how do we take into account the setup of the healthcare professionals in all different levels? And each one will have their own answer in this regard. We can also suppose a person that is coming from a rural area, if this person will be coming one, two, or three times, or as many times as they have to come to be able to be cared for. We also have a number of 17 visits a person had to make to the healthcare center to be able to conduct the treatment, 17 visits. If that person had been from a rural area or from a distant village from the health services, they wouldn't have been able to conclude what is their care for the disease. So how can we help? Here, this slide provides some information not complete information, but let's work with what we have. Cooperating against prejudice, discrimination, or neglect for persons with Chagas disease, facilitating comprehensive and equitable care, participating in information and communication on Chagas disease. But here we come back to the same point, adequately training healthcare professionals and working for there to exist and to be laws and re rules to be implemented and enforced. In this case, I would say that. Let's see. Well, let's facilitate the lay about diagnosis and treatment and reporting of cases. But first and foremost, what we need to do is to prove the operational efficacy of the Chagas disease programs. When a program reaches the front line where the treatment is applied, haven't, have you read, have you analyzed, have they read and analyzed what's supposed to be enforced? Otherwise, the program is not going to be effective. And another one of the important causes of not having or not being able to work in the ministries of health is because there's no uh, dedicated earmarked budget for the disease, as in some countries, like in Mexico, Chagas disease is part of a package where the budget is for several different vector-borne diseases. So if this year another vector-borne disease increases, like dengue fever, for example, the budget will all be shifted to dengue fever, but Chagas disease, since it's a silent disease and the symptoms are almost invisible in the acute phase, we're not going to have the budget this year and will be uh, postponed until next year. And the next slide, please. So we are Fin de Chagas. Here we can see the foundation of federation, rather of associations. It's symbolic. This was the last time that we met in person with the Federation of Chagas Patients Associations in the second we had to do this, the next time we had to do a virtual meeting. Here, uh, this quote in her memory, for many physicians or healthcare professionals, we are just statistics. One more uh, task, uh, another uh, patient, as many others that come into their clinic. But for us, these physicians, these healthcare professionals, they are the hope for life and family well-being. That is why we ask that from this day on, they help us to know how many we are and where we are. The next slide, please. We'll see and acknowledgements. By way of conclusion, recording that we have two websites. One is in Facebook, Fin de Chagas, you have to go to the official uh, page and not get confused. Another website for Fin de Chagas 
In the photograph, you can see a picture of what we do in Mexico when we go out into the rural areas to provide information on Chagas disease. This is our main concern to reach those who have less information in the towns were better the cities were better informed but in the rural areas the small villages in whether they're endemic or not who's going to give them information on chagas disease and why i say endemic or not because now we can travel to many places where an endemic area but living in a non-endemic area to be a carrier of t cruza and to not know it unless if a blood test as is happening, we realize, we discover, but since we don't have a culture of blood donation and we only donate blood when we have a family member who's ill, how are we going to determine to know that we have Chagas disease, the infection, if we don't have information? It's extremely important. This information is what we provide and furnish in Amapach, in all the associations around the world, that is what we're doing, to provide information to contribute to healthcare services for many people affected by the disease to be able to prevent, to be, have their diagnosis, to be able to prevent and to live a long, healthy life as uh, since Carlos Chagas, ever since he discovered the disease. I want to thank you all for the opportunity and thank you very much indeed and that you have a very fruitful and enjoyable day. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Elvira Idalia Hernandez Cuevas, and I want to greet uh, for, I had a wonder, Pipian, a Mexican dish, when we had an in-person meeting. We'll invite you to have mole, the uh, pepper sauce dishes my friend Lilian Albert, a great friend of mine uh, in Jalapas. I always recall, have her in my heart, Vera Cruz. Uh, great, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Come back again and enjoy some more Mexican dishes. So Jalapa is a special place. Everyone, if you can visit, don't miss the opportunity to visit Jalapas. Vera Cruz is an area very close to Brazil. That's where we have the landscape and people who are very warm and friendly. And they say that you, uh, they, you can see it's a typical music from uh, Veracruz. Uh, and thank you, Adan, for your excellent presentation. And thank you for your work that you do here and that of Ana Maria, who's shown us here the history of the movement of associations of persons affected by Chagas disease. You were crucial in creating the day, Chagas Disease Day. I was in Geneva that year, and I attended myself when they enacted the day and sitting behind the Brazilian delegation with President Nisi and other colleague, Pedro Albajar, a person who all of us know, Pedro, a great activist who leads the struggle in this struggle on Chagas Disease, and President Nisi Trindade Liba, who held an the excellent work in the backstage to be able to enact the day and to this vibrant uh, reception that the proposal had that day. But I'd just like to say some final words because when we talked to Paulo Bus, the director of the Fucurus Global Health Center, who sends you all warm greetings, by the way, and Professor Paulo Gadelia, also, who heads the initiative for the 2030 agenda in Fiocruz. We talked a lot bit about this disease, which has taught us so much. I, When I was at PAHO, I remember that at the WHO, they began to close off the area called the hub, which is a, the place, housing, housing was the Chagas disease issue. And Chagas disease was also under control. So they couldn't justify a world program because it was a regional problem, a housing problem, which is already under control. And with Salvatella and Uruguay working closely together and an environmental part that I headed into with the vector control program. And we made major strides, but it's a disease that uh, tricked us because in the United States, there are 300,000 people with the infection with T. cruzi in Europe, countless cases in Australia. I saw a map that you showed. It's a disease which is no longer 
it has become a global disease again it's a disease which prevents sustainable development it's an obstacle it reveals and unveils inequality just as covid 19 unveiled inequalities it affects the poorest it affects people in rural areas and affects now people in urban areas in other words it's a disease which was essentially rural and now it's a urban concern in the larger cities in the developed countries including in the developed countries so it's a disease which unveils this issue that we are confronting today of the syndemic where several different diseases affect the same person and in social conditions which have never before been seen so clearly in terms of disadvantage socioeconomic disadvantage and challenges and inequality so actually it is a disease which not only includes a message and a problem that you are reflecting on clearly here but it entails a message of how global health is bigger than the thinking and the portrait that we can have of a disease at a given moment. And it requires this global effort, which on Chagas Day, we are addressing and attempting to mobilize in order to focus our attention on these endemic issues, the major challenges that can prevent our development. I also enjoyed seeing the last photograph by Idal. Uh, did this years ago. I come from this tradition of public health of out in the field. I'm proud to know all the counties of Bahia where I worked with primary care with Gaston Wagner to create this wheel of people or circle of people that work with health. So this work, which is so important in communication, and edu health education, health promotion, which today and at the time of communication, it's essential and crucial for the major communications channels to support us and to take this message out into the people. And fin de Chagas, the end of Chagas, for people who talk constantly, I give classes as well. At the Georgetown University, I use English a lot, so it's as if it were find Chagas. I get confused sometimes to find Chagas. It's today's message to find Chagas, not just the end of Chagas, but to find Chagas, to find all the Chagas cases, to be able to reach them, help them, treat them, to monitor their uh, progression, we, the painful progression of this disease, not only for the carriers, but also for the uh, children and grandchildren or people that live with them. So I think that this day is an essential day. And I would again like to highlight the importance of the work that you do in the movement of associations on Chagas Day. And I want to thank Anna and Elvira and paying tribute to this. I want to conclude with the presentation of a video, a video, uh, Sonia, uh, which of course you're familiar with, but which the audience doesn't know. But I'd like to ask the communications experts to show us the video, and after which we'll come back for the commentary by Elvira and Anna Maria. It's estimated that in Argentina, there are at least 1.6 million people with Chagas disease. Here in San Tibusu, we have wells, but there's no running water. Well, the water is used for the, our livestock and for our consumption as well. And here we live mainly from producing on our, our subsistence farming and to sell goats and sheep and chicken, uh, turkeys and so forth, all our livestock and poultry. I love the life out here. I love life out here in the countryside to be with our livestock and poultry here out in the field. It's a little bit more difficult, but it's beautiful nevertheless, life out here. We're far from ambulances, doctors, and everything. It's remote. A few months ago, I was pregnant. I did two tests to see whether I had Chagas T. Cruzi to see if I affected my own health and that of my infant. I took the test. Chagas is a problem that has already been present. Always welcome to the Chagas research program. So it was a neglected disease and we began to organize and we began to organize to screen for Chagas disease. And we dedicated our first two cases, which were little girls. One of them is Sonia, who is now a healthcare promoter, a 
community health worker. I found that I had Chagas during a campaign, a screening campaign. I, I, and they said, okay, nobody can be discriminated against because they have Chagas disease, okay? I was 13 years old at the time. And I didn't care very much because I was just a teenager. I don't know how I got infected. Maybe it was because I lived for years in a house with a lot of cracks in the walls. I do well with Chagas. I don't have any symptoms. I have a, live a normal life. I take good care of my health, whatever I can, and I do uh, regular checkups. We, when we began to organize with health, there were no physicians out here. We built a kind of health, which is home visits, a way of struggling against Chagas disease is to organize the community to raise demands, to see how the living conditions are, the housing conditions, and to screen for Chagas. I took the test and based on people's needs, we began to organize and prepare to attend because there were a lot of people, adults, and we wanted to screen to determine whether they had the infection or not. So if you have the infection, it's good to know because you can do an EKG. Yeah. Thinking of the activities and demanding, there's, there are laws, there are programs, which are the ones that should be present out in the countryside. And that doesn't happen. The organized families raise their own voice. And one of uh, the important parts is the campaigns to screen to determine whether people have T. cruzi infection because a campaign reaches a lot of people. And we can see in the campaigns, the health campaigns that we do house by house, there are a lot of kissing bugs, the triatamins. So uh, we do... Uh, fumigating to determine whether there are kissing bugs and to know what Chagas disease, how the people live. That when I, they were flying around the houses, there are a lot of uh, the uh, tratamins and the cracks in the walls. By the Argentina had committed to eliminating Sonia is a, a farmer. She's organized with the other family farmers in the area. She's a healthcare worker, with, uh, has a, takes a feminist perspective with collective health, building collective health. What I like a lot is to be able to help a lot of people who need help. I'm studying to be a community health worker, going to the meetings and the courses, learning more and more all the time with the farmers movement in Cordoba, most of the people are women. This is good also because uh, the people participate more, the women farmers to train, to help others, which is the main thing out here in the countryside. Here, you can ask them about any diseases they may have. I took the test a long time ago. I tested negative here in San Tiburcio. Medical care is not part of the community. It's not part of it. Here, all over, there are a lot of tritamins, the kissing bugs. We're the ones who visit house by house. We first do a survey of the entire community. We take note of all their dates, disease history, the medication they may be using. We want uh, Chagas Research to become to, to do the screening again. You can see there are kissing bugs and the cracks in the walls. If there are a lot of kissing bugs, they spread more in the summer and spring. So we need to spray there to be able to kill the kissing bugs to prevent the disease from affecting. Uh, and we need to screen as well to do the blood tests in the mothers because of the mother to child transmission. During my pregnancy, I did electrocardiographs every month. Uh, she's called Miss Sayal. I She was tested. I'm going to test. She's going to be a test. She's going to be tested again. She tested negative, and I hope that this one will be negative, of course, again. And my daughter, I hope uh, she doesn't have 
Uh, he doesn't have Chagas either. 1,300 children are born in Argentina with Chagas disease. The state should be more present here, the government, because the kissing bugs are here and the government should pay closer attention and spraying, detecting the disease because the kissing bugs are there. They haven't disappeared. I love living here. I chose to live here and to continue to struggle for our rights and for our health, especially, and for all our community's rights. The uh, kissing bugs come out from the forest and where they're forest, there are small farmers. So what we have to do is take preventive measures and epidemiological surveillance because the kissing bugs are not going to disappear here, neither are the family farmers. So we want the family farming farmers to organize, to continue to live in the countryside and to care for the forest as all of us do. As health promoters, we're gonna to continue to struggle to have decent housing free of kissing bugs, the vectors of Chagas disease. I, who I, I have Chagas myself, I love living out in the countryside, even though there are kissing bugs here, the vectors. In 2018, the General uh, Ombudsman Office launched an investigation and required more in investment in Chagas disease. Help us demand the end of Chagas with the Chagas project. This was produced by uh, the, these two organizations in the international budget, funded by the International Budget Partnership. Thank you very much. This was an excellent uh, video, which also shows us the reality on a daily basis of living with Chagas and at the same time fighting Chagas. So I'd like to give the floor to Maria first uh, for some of the final comments and then to Italy in uh, this very informative uh, morning that we are having. Professor Nizia has mentioned the importance of surveillance, as well as many others have mentioned many things which are important. But I see this surveillance, which is also associated to the topic, the motto of how many we are and where we are, in a citizen surveillance, a surveillance which brings access and right to health, to universal health and fully integrated. So I would like to wrap up saying that may we conclude this global agenda and that we may face all of this situation, which to a certain extent has a uh, neglect regarding Chagas disease, a disease of 113 years with a study which is close to perfection of Carlos Chagas. To date, he is still a reference in training students of medicine with a study which is fully integrated in terms of knowledge in this concept and also defending life. So, this is the role each and every one of us has, be it as professionals, be it as people with Chagas disease, be it as people in this network, that we may more and more often be able to intensify this network and to overcome this moment on a daily basis building each and every one of these actions, these activities, and that we may come to have a health which truly allows us to treat the individual, not only as a patient of part of their body, but also as a person, as someone who participates in a society. Thank you very much, Dr. Guto, and it's great to have you here with us. It was a great pleasure to get to know you uh, more, to get to know you better, and I'm very happy 
that you have made so many important comments on Chagas disease. Thank you very much, uh, Namadi. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And to be honest, I was a, a medicine student in the 70s many years ago. And even in uh, surgery, my professor of surgery, of GI and vascular surgery. And one of the main things in his research was Chagas. So Chagas is truly linked in all the training of Brazilian physicians. We learn this, we have to do this in an effective manner, present on a daily basis in the healthcare system. So once again, it's a great pleasure to get to know you. Thank you very much for your activity and your tenacity with this topic. Now I'd like to hear the final comments of Idalia. Uh, that's how they call you, right? Idalio, Idalia. If you could please make your comments. Thank you very much. I consider that the reporting of cases is something which is of great importance. Very, very important. And may we all support with our small uh, grain of uh, sand, despite not being professionally linked to the Chagas disease, but we may uh, talk about it to many people. We might share on our uh, social media that information and I believe that would help us to break the epidemiological silence we have to make uh, the people affected visible and above all to have more resources for the diagnosis and therefore to be able to treat more people. I believe that the prevention programs should they be permanent in our countries that would give people the opportunity to have the information and to therefore be able to know of what is happening in the areas, especially what we have in the videos in the rural areas. There's a lot of lack of knowledge. They live with uh, the bug, but they don't know what it can cause. Therefore, this is a big damage, the lack of resources, because many of the populations don't even have money for gasoline to start the treatment. In other words, as a diagnosis, people have Chagas. We already know this, but the treatment takes months, years to arrive in some situations. Therefore, to have these resources, and I must repeat, to prove that these programs are uh, uh, operational. Sometimes we know that we work, but we don't. And this is something which is very common in all types of uh, pr practices, education, health. It seems that they are working, but they're not. So that is why it is important for us to prove that this is something operational, at least in my opinion. As well as some cases, the uh, Mexican professors, they give us an exam. After 20 years of working, giving classes, I believe it is more important that we are able to prove that the physicians are aware of how to treat Chagas. That is very important because from our case, uh, the education of the professors, is that's what it depends on. But the final aspect is it depends on the life of a human being. Florentina, 31 years of age, dies of Chagas, leaving three boys uh, uh, orphans. The eldest was seven years old, and this is something very common to see here in Mexico, and I believe in all countries where there are Chagas. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity and for the presentations which have been made and for all of us to be able to help. Thank you very much, uh, Elvira Idalia Hernandez Cuevas. It's a great pleasure to get to meet you. I hope to be able to see you shortly. And as you mentioned, it is something which is very important. And above all, that is the moment of uh, finding the Chagas cases to treat them. This is the moment to train the professionals, the healthcare professionals. And I say this because we are living another crisis, the crisis of climate change, the crisis of global warming. We are aware that these bugs will multiply more often. They will be more present. This disease will have the trend to grow. So this is a moment where we can do something to reduce the impact.
this is when we must be active. So I think it is crucial to make a call both by Ana Maria and by Dalia to go out into the field, to train our professionals, to go out into the field and to ask these professionals to be active, to go out into the field and to find the Chagas cases. And this afternoon, we're going to continue talking about this. Fiocruz has a huge commitment with Chagas. All of us in Fiocruz are very proud of being the Carlos Chagas home and to have a huge commitment with clinical research, epidemiology, social research of all of this dramatic situation of Chagas. So I'd like to thank all of you for being here. And I am sure that this is a video which will be watched many by many, many people. So I'd like to thank all of you who watched the video and to please enjoy this message and that might take this message onwards, take it to your healthcare professionals, take them to your communities, take them to your physicians, pay attention to Chagas disease. Thank you very much. And once again, I'd like to give the floor back to Ines, and I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you very much, Guto and our speakers. Before wrapping up, I would like to ask if uh, Dr. Dalton would like to make any final remarks or if we can go on to the closing panel. I think we can uh, close this. Lots has been said. So I would just like to once again thank everyone for their efforts uh, for this event. And let us continue then to the afternoon session, which will obviously have many more topics on Chagas disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Deilton. As that is the case, we would like to thank all of you who have been with us in this Zoom session, those who have been watching us through the Fiocruz uh, YouTube channel. We're going to have a quick break now, and we will be back at 1 p.m. Brazil time for us to continue with our schedule. See you all shortly. Thank you.